Divine Truth Frequently Asked Question Session. Jesus, Mary and others provide answers to questions that are frequently asked by members of the media and public. This presentation is part of the Cults and Cult Leaders series. Mary asked Jesus questions on the subject of cults, religious practices and beliefs. Recorded on the 13th of November 2012 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session 1, part 2. Do you call your home the headquarters? Do I call my home the headquarters? No. I call my home the home. Mary calls our home our home. And sometimes we have other words for our home, perhaps. <laughs> but certainly not the headquarters. The, the whole headquarters accusation comes from the Channel 7 film crew who stayed with us at our home. And they then called our home that they stayed in the headquarters it's just so that they could gain some kind of media uh, outrage about what we're doing, uh, along with a lot of other lies that they told at the time. They also said there were hi hidden cameras at our seminars, when actually we have photographs in our seminars and video in our seminars of the cameras that were meant to have been hidden. So, you know, they lied so much during these reports and they lied mostly because they knew they'd probably get away with it with me and I probably wouldn't attack them or take them to court. And because they knew that, um, they then decided to lie as much as they wanted to and they know they're probably going to get away with it until somebody comes along and watches this kind of frequently asked question presentation that uh, where we can actually say the truth to them about what actually happened. But unfortunately, most people listen to the media, believe that they're telling the truth, and then don't assume that there is other inf information available that would indicate that the media has lied. In this case, the media has lied consistently over and over and over again, constantly, and still continues to do so. And, and yet most people do not even consider questioning them. And I find that quite concerning. The fact that media can lie so much and have no self-regulation about the lies. The so-called code of practice here in Australia is a farce because the media can lie so much and get away with it and nobody addresses it whatsoever. This is the reason why we do our own presentations because you cannot trust anything that the media says to you, in my opinion. And nowadays we find it very, very difficult to trust anything the media says as a result of how the media has treated us. Because if the media has treated us this way, we have to question how the media is treating every person that they ever interview and how the media is falsifying everything that seems to occur, or at least putting it out of harmony with truth. I'm sure there must be some people in the media who have ethics, but I personally have yet to meet one of them. Hmm. Have you been given property from other people that you live on? No, we have not been given property from any person. The media is constantly stating to us that we have been, that in fact, I had an interview just a few weeks ago where people said to me, uh, the interviewer asked me or stated in his opening remarks that I was living on a 600 acre property donated by, the, by other people. This is not true. I said to him in the interview that it is not true. Myself and Mary live on a 40 acre property that I bought seven or eight years ago now here in the local area near Kingaroy. We do not own any other property. We do not control any other property. We do not push any person around who has any other property. We only give advice where we are invited to give advice. That's all we do. I do not own any property other than the actual property, the 40 acre property that I purchased eight years ago with my own funds. We have not received enough donations in order to purchase any property, let alone have a property that we live on that's been donated to us. We have had people offer properties to us, which we have declined because we believe it is far better that we share, use our time sharing with people what we have learned on our own property rather than having another property to look after. As Mary knows, 
it's difficult for me to look after my own property, the 40 acres, let alone attempt to look after hundreds of properties around the earth. However, that all being said, there are many people around the earth who have asked us to be a part of helping them set up what they are wanting to term learning centres. This comes from the constitution of the God's Way of Love organisation that we have set up, where we have suggested the appropriate way to manage a property. And many of these people want our advice in terms of helping manage those properties. So what we do is we give them advice. If they don't want advice anymore, we don't give them advice anymore. They continue to own their own properties, whether they take advice from us or not. Obviously, if they decide to not take advice from us, we no longer give them advice. And, and therefore, you know, they won't be associated with us in any way. If they desire to take advice from us, which some do, then we will continue to give them advice as long as they desire it. Just like we continue to give information to any person as long as that person desires it. However, we do not own these properties and we do not have control of these properties in any way. We don't have financial, do not have financial control of the properties, nor do we have direct operational control of the properties. All we do is make suggestions which people are able to choose to follow or not, depending on their desires. Cults are often not upfront with people. Are you hiding things from people until they become ready to cope with what you say to them? <laughs> no. Most people would say to me that they do not want to hear from me because they cannot cope with what I'm already saying to them. I don't hide any truth, what I believe to be truth, from any person, even if later on I've got to then change, if I've got to change my concept of truth. So if a person asks me today, what do you believe about such and such a subject? I will answer them honestly about what I believe about such and such a subject. Next week, if I've changed my mind and they ask me the same question, I will give them the answer to which I've changed my mind to. I will tell them the truth at the time as I know it. That is what I do. So yes, I will change my mind depending on how much more things I learn. But I am not in the business of, you know, determining how people decide or what people choose to do with that particular information. All I am doing is saying the truth to them, what I believe the truth to be at the time. I am certainly not hiding things from people until they become ready to learn the truth. I believe quite strongly that, that we need to share the truth even if other people are not ready for it. I believe quite strongly that it is not my right to choose whether a person is ready. It is not my right to decide for them whether they are ready. They need to decide for themselves whether they are ready or not. So if a person says to me, look, AJ, I do not want to hear from you about that subject, I say, fine, what subject would you like to discuss then? <laughs> or I say, okay, that's the subject I want to discuss, so I'm going. <laughs> But I do not ever force a subject on a person. My suggestion, though, is that many people are afraid of hearing truth. And in fact, most of the people who come along to my presentations are afraid of hearing the truth. This is one of the reasons why most people who come to the presentations don't agree with me, because they don't agree with what they believe is my version of the truth. Now, I'm just stating to people that I do not believe it's my version of the truth. But that's up to them to decide as well. It is their choice, their decision. I do not force them to make a choice or decision. Most people who accuse you of leading a cult say that the world's religions are not cults, but real religious organisations. What would you say to that? Well, firstly, if we look at what I placed on the internet under the frequently asked questions about what I believe a cult to be, many of the world's religions would actually come under that definition. Secondly, I do not believe attacking people and calling things cults is actually the way to address any of those issues. So I, I feel quite strongly that we need to love every single person on this planet, no matter what their religious, cultural, social, sexual, or other backgrounds are. So I, I personally cannot see how 
any individual on this planet can attack another individual on the planet without there being some kind of substance to the attack. And even then, there's no need to attack. There's just a need to state the truth. So when it comes to the world's religions, it is interesting that many of the current world religions, when they first became established, were viewed as cults by the present religions at the time. And yet many of these religions then became to be established religions. And then after that point in time, the people then accepted them and therefore no longer called them a cult. It appears to me that almost any new movement on the planet is treated with suspicion, sometimes initially laughter, then suspicion, then violence, and then acceptance. When we could skip over the laughter, the suspicion and the violence and go straight to acceptance. And I feel this is what uh, most people on the planet need to do with any new thing that occurs on the planet. We need to go straight to acceptance. We need to say to ourselves, okay, this particular movement, whatever it is, whether it's even evil or not, this particular movement has been created. We need to accept it's been created. And then we need to ask ourselves questions about whether its creation was what it was what caused its creation. Now, in some cases, what is caused what has caused its creation is a dissatisfaction with the current particular movements on the planet. So, for example, a new political party often gets set up on the planet when there is a dissatisfaction with the old political parties in a certain governmental system. A new religious movement often gets set up on the planet when there is a dissatisfaction with the old religious movements on the planet. Every time someone is dissatisfied with something, generally something new gets created. I don't believe that is a necessarily a negative thing. It is something that is a fact of life, that every time there is dissatisfaction, something new generally happens. What I do see as a negative thing is when the new thing being created is created out of violence or it's created to perpetrate violence. These are the things I would be more concerned about if I was a person examining what I am teaching. What I would be concerned about if I was, if I was a listener is, am, is A.J. Miller, who claims to be Jesus, teaching violence or preaching violence? Is he being abusive? Is he being controlling, manipulative? Is he looking for power? Is he looking for glory? Or is he just stating that he's Jesus and then stating a heap of other things that he believes to be true also? That's the question that you need to ask. I know what I'm doing. I am just stating what I know to be the truth. Whether you believe that it's the truth or not is up to you. I don't condemn you if you don't. I'm just stating what I know to be the truth. If I don't know it, I say, I don't know, which is also something not many other people do. But if I do know it, I will say that I feel I know it. And I will state that I feel I know it, but you don't have to believe me. And I, my suggestion is you go through your own emotional experience to determine what is truth and what is not. Go through your own experience with God to determine what is God's love and what is not. Go through your own experience with other people to determine what is loving and what is not. In your day-to-day -day life, examine through your own experience what is ethical and what is not. I believe I do know what those things are, but I am also open to being shown that I don't. And, and if a person is truly humble, they will also be open to that. I feel quite strongly that if we do those particular things, we'll never need to fear whether there is another religious movement on the planet that is a cult, we'll never need to worry about what's happened historically or what's being produced even right now. We will always be examining ourselves to become more loving. That's all we need to do. So I believe that the world's religious organisations need to do that. What they need to do is examine whether their behaviour is ethical. They need to do, examine whether their behaviour is loving. They need to examine whether their beliefs about God are loving. They need to examine whether their beliefs about people on earth, other people who are not a part of their faith, are loving. If they examine these things more carefully and with an open and honest heart, 
they would automatically know what to do with their belief systems and their way of life and the way in which they govern their organizations. The problem is most religions on the planet are not doing that. Most religions on the planet have a very fixed opinion of what is true and they are willing to kill other people who disagree. And this is something very much out of harmony with love. It perpetrates more violence on the planet and therefore is far more damaging than anything I have ever taught. Do you believe you are the Messiah? Yes, I do. Of course I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be saying that I'm Jesus. And in the first century, I said I was the Messiah. It depends on what a person believes the Messiah to be. In the first century, when I was alive, a lot of people believed that the Messiah would be a king and a person who came to destroy the Roman Empire and who would come to, you know, release the Jews from the captivity of the Romans and would finish up in some kind of world dominating political power. That's what they believed the Messiah to be. I knew that that's not the, what the Messiah is. All the Messiah is, is a person who is the first person to develop a relationship with God the way God intended it to be. They're just the first person who did that. And they're the Messiah in the sense that they can then lead other people into doing the same thing. And that's all I chose to do in the first century. And that's all I've been doing for 2000 years. It is interesting today, people believe the Messiah will almost do the same thing as what people believed in the first century. They believe the Messiah would come, Jesus would come on a, on a throne uh, with all of his angels and destroy the wicked at, a, at an event called Armageddon and would establish a righteous government on earth well, as a world power. Now, the thing they've never questioned is, if I did not do that in the first century, why would I want to do that now? And I don't want to do that now. Being the Messiah is just about being the first person who's ever come into a relationship of atonement with God. That's all it was. And that's all it ever will be for me. It's about the fact that I was the very first person on this planet to get into that condition. I'm not the only person who's ever been in that condition. I'm only the first person who was in that condition. I am referred to as the Messiah because I've helped other people come to that same condition. But I don't believe that that makes me any better than them. All it, all it means is that I have a strong desire for God and a strong desire for truth and a strong desire to be humble in my relationship with God. And that enabled me to learn things that other people did not learn because they did not have those same desires. So that's how I feel I am the Messiah. But I do not believe, and I will not ever accept that I need to be worshipped, that I need to be the king of anything, that I need, and in fact, I believe quite strongly that my God is my king, and my God, my creator, is the person, if I'm going to worship, that would be the person I would worship. And in fact, I recommend to people to not have anything more to do with worshipping me, because if they do, they'll be severely disappointed. Do you believe you have direct authority from God that puts you above other people? No, I don't believe I have direct authority from God that puts me above other people. I believe that God and myself are in a relationship and every other child of God is able to have exactly the same kind of relationship with God. In other words, from God's perspective, we are all equal. We are all equal in worth and value. However, there are some people who have received more of God's love than other people. The reason why this is the case is because those people who received more love wanted to have more love. Because they're of their desire for more love, God gave them more love. They had to firstly exercise that desire. I have exercised the desire to receive love from God. It's been my primary motive and intention all of my life. As a result of that, I have received a lot of love from God as a direct result of my desire. Every other person on the planet can receive the same amount of love from God that what I, as what I have received, and every other person on the planet can receive the same amount of truth that I have received. They can, but the question is, 
will they? They will only be able to do it if they desire it. That's what I'm teaching. So I don't believe I have any direct authority from God. God is the person in authority. God is the person that defined all of God's laws. God is, is the person that put all of these laws into action. I live under every one of God's laws, just like every other person that God has ever created lives under every one of God's laws. God is the law maker and the law giver, and I am the law abider. So I don't believe I have any more authority than any other person. Of course, if I have received love from God, I do understand a lot about love. And I believe many people on the planet need to learn a lot about love because there is not much love on the planet. And this is one of the reasons why I'm here is to share what I believe about love to other people if they want to hear it. I don't believe that that places me in a place of authority. It places me in a place where I desire to share what I know. And that's what I'm doing, sharing what I know. Now, in the spirit world, when I was living in the spirit world, I did have some authority in the sense that because I was one of the most loving persons in the spirit world, other people would listen to me because they wanted to become more loving themselves. And that is the only way in which I have any authority is, is the way in which people are willing to listen if they want to, to anything I say because they believe personally that I have a more of an understanding of love than they do. Now, a lot of people on this planet don't believe that, and that's fine by me. They don't have to believe that. But there are some people on the planet who do believe that I know more about love than they do, and so they listen to what I say about love, and then they try to or attempt to practice it. I don't believe that places me in a position of authority, but rather places me in a position where I am able to share what I have learned with other people. And that's what I love doing. Do you believe you're better than other people? <laughs> no, I do not believe I'm better than other people. And in fact, uh, if I did believe I was better than other people, I don't think Mary would actually live with me. <laughs> um, the reality is I believe I'm the same as other people. I do not believe I'm worse than other people. I believe that I am the same as other people. I believe that I have the same worthiness in God's eyes as every other person who God has ever created. I believe that uh, I am just as worthy as the most, you know, the, the most uh, powerful person on the planet. I believe I am just as worthy as the most destitute person on the planet. I believe they have as much worth as I do. In terms of personal opinion about my worth, I feel that we are all equal and I believe that in my heart. This is why I treat other people with the same respect as what I expect to be treated myself. That's why I'm ethical in my relationship with others. That's why I practice what I preach when I come to you know, treating other people in the way in which I would like to be treated. Because I believe that everyone has the same worth and everyone deserves to be treated in the same way. Do you allow people to question you? <laughs> well, if anybody who watched my seminars, they wouldn't ask that question because the reality is most people who come to my seminars question me constantly. Um, so yes, of course, I allow people to question me. I don't allow people to treat me badly while they're questioning me. I feel there's a difference between allowing someone to ask you a question and someone who's asking you a question in order to attack you. I don't believe that I need to be attacked in any way, and I wouldn't attack another person if I was asking them questions. And so I feel people are allowed to ask questions as long as their questions are, are, are you know, stated with a loving attitude. That being said, there's been many times in my seminars where people haven't stated their questions in a loving way, and I've still answered them. I do believe, however, that it is important for us all to start questioning with a more open attitude. What I notice happening a lot in my seminars is that people ask a question when really they want to make a statement. What I mean by that is they ask me, they, they, they couch a question 
when really they just want to make a statement about me to me. And, and I don't believe this is a very valid form of questioning. If a person is truly sincere, they will ask a question without attempting to make statements. If we want to have a conversation, then make some statements. That's fine by me. But make the statements rather than trying to turn them into questions. Make the statements. What do you believe? You can say to me, I don't believe you're Jesus. And I'll go, fine. That's okay. Can we move on? <laughs> if a person says, are you Jesus? Oftentimes they're not making, having a question, are you Jesus? Because I've already told them that I am. They're actually making a statement that they don't believe I am. Does that make sense? And so what I'm trying to do is say to them, well, you can make the statement that you do not believe that I'm Jesus, and I'm perfectly happy to accept your statement, but that's not a question. If you're asking me whether I'm saying I'm Jesus, certainly I am. That is a question, and I'll answer the question, yes. But, it, but when people couch their comments as questions, when really they want to make statements, then I will actually look at their underlying emotional issues or reasons as to why they want to do that with them in an open forum. Many people become quite afraid of that. So in other words, if a person came to me and said, are you Jesus, when they've heard me say many times to them that I am, then I would say to them, why are you asking this question again? What emotion in you is causing you to ask this question in the way in which you have? Because I've already answered the question. I don't need to answer it again. I've already stated quite clearly what the answer is. My suggestion is if you come along to a seminar, come prepared to answer, ask sincere questions. And I will come prepared to give you a sincere answer about what I believe to be true. You do not have to believe me, but you definitely need to treat me with some respect while you're asking me the question. Because if you don't, I will ask you to leave my seminar. I'm paying for your seat and I'm paying for the venue and I'm spending my time with you for free. You definitely need to treat me with some respect. If you don't, don't come. Because if you come with that attitude, I'll send you home. And if you don't go home, I'll call the police, in fact. Because I actually have a feeling of my own worth that it is, I feel I am worth as much as you are. And therefore, I don't deserve to be attacked, just like you don't deserve to be attacked. So don't come to my seminars if you expect to attack me. Come to my seminars if you want to sincerely ask some questions that you would like to have answered. Or come to my seminars on certain subjects because you'd like to know more about that particular subject. That's my suggestion. When will you not allow people to question you? There are times when I will definitely not allow people to question me. The first time that I will not allow people to question me is when a person is treating me in a condescending, belittling or attacking manner. I don't see any reason why I should answer such questions. I don't see any reason why I should even give those people who would want to attack me my time. My time is a gift and my, my, my time is worth as much as anybody else's time. So if you come along to any of my seminars or, or, or question me in any way and in, in an attacking manner, I don't feel that I have to answer you. I may answer you, but I don't feel I have to answer you. Under those circumstances, it's highly likely that I possibly will not answer you. If you decide too to ask me questions in a condescending and belittling manner, then it's highly likely that I'll eventually terminate the conversation and I'll answer your questions. The reason why is because I have some self-esteem. It might not be enough yet to actually attract everyone treating me in a respectful manner, but it's certainly enough for me to recognize when somebody isn't treating me with any respect. And why would I wish to give my time as a gift to somebody who doesn't treat me with any respect? Now this applies whether you're a member of the media or any other person. If you come along uh, asking questions in a belittling or attacking manner, then the conversation will be terminated and you can go on your way because I do not want to engage with you under those circumstances. I will only engage with you if you're willing to treat me in the manner which I am willing to treat you, and that is with respect. I am willing to answer any question, but I'm not willing to answer any attack. 
I'm not willing to be belittled. I'm not willing to be condescended to, and I'm not willing to be laughed at. I am willing to answer any question that is done from a sincere heart, from a sincere desire to know the truth of the answer. So if you are any member of the public or any member of the media who wishes to come and ask me questions on those in, in that way, I am perfectly happy to answer any of those questions. However, don't expect that you can come along and ask me questions in any of the manners that I've illustrated and not have the conversation terminated because I definitely will terminate a conversation that I feel is out of harmony with love of myself. Do you believe that you are the only source of truth on the planet? I believe the only source of truth is God. That's what I believe. I also believe that any single individual on this planet or in the spirit world who, who are obviously still alive, people who are still alive even though people on earth believe they're dead, any single one of those people is able to receive direct information to God about any answer they wish to ask about, any question they wish to ask about. So I actually feel that any single person who is God's child has the ability to connect to God directly and receive information from God about any question. Of course, if two different people connect to God and claim they are connecting to God, then if God's giving them the answer, the answer will be identical. This whole concept that God will give different answers to different people is flawed in its logic. The issue we face, though, is how many people are actually connecting to God and getting direct answers from God on the truth of different subjects. And my feelings are very few people are actually doing that. And this is evidenced by the how many religions there are being practiced on the planet. I think there are seven or eight thousand religions currently on the planet. And this is an indication that there are seven or eight thousand groups of people who are in direct disharmony with God. Because if they were in harmony with God, they would all have the same concept of love and the same belief systems about the truth. See, I believe that God has absolute truth. And when we come to accept God's truth in our heart through a process where we connect with God individually, we finish up having the same opinion on the same issue with regard to truth. It doesn't mean that we have the same personality. And it doesn't mean we have the same expression of our personality. And it doesn't mean that we have the same desires. But it just means that if you ask a question such as, is there a spirit world? The answer of all of the people who are connecting to God will be identical. The fact that it's not identical on this planet at this point in time indicates that the majority of people are, who claim they're connecting with God are not connecting with God but rather are connecting either with someone else or just with their own ideas. I am not doing that. Now, you don't have to believe that. I am just stating that that's not what I've done. What I'm trying to do before I share truth with others is I'm trying to discover the truth myself through this connection with God. I am willing to be wrong and I'm willing to change. However, I am also going to be a person who is sincere about that particular process. Because I am so sincere about that particular process, the truth is that I have a lot of truth that this planet has never seen before that I can share with different people on this planet. But I am not the only one who's able to discover it. Any person is able to discover it if they're willing to go through the same process God showed me I had to go through in order to discover it. So while I believe all of us are capable of receiving truth in the same manner from God, I do not believe all of us are receiving truth in the same manner from God. And that is because we are unwilling to accept God's method of receiving that particular information. What I'm attempting to show people is that I believe I have discovered God's method 2000 years ago, and I'm attempting to share that method with people. If they try that same method, then God will be able to share with them truth, just as God has shared with me truth. And I am not the only person who can receive this truth because every single one of God's children has the ability to receive this truth. 
It's just whether we're open to receiving it or not as to whether we do. And this is where I feel the main problem is. Most people on the planet are not open to receiving God's truth. They are only open to receiving their own ideas reflected back at themselves. And that's why there is very little truth on the planet. Do you attempt to cut people off from their family or friends? Definitely not. I believe very strongly that there is no need to cut people off from anything that is currently attracted to their life because they have attracted these people into their life and they need to interact with them in order to work through specific things that they need to personally work through in order to grow in their own soul. What happens often though is people who come along to my seminars report to me that, that often their family start attacking them for coming along to my seminars. Now obviously if you as a family start attacking an individual in your family, that individual is going to feel cut off from their family. And that individual is probably not going to want to associate with people who attack them all the time, so that individual will probably withdraw from the family. My suggestion is if a family member believes that I have somehow caused another one of their family to no longer speak to them, my suggestion is for that family member to examine their own personal behaviour towards the family member who's left them and work out what has been unloving in the interaction. That's what I would suggest to the person. Obviously, if somebody treats us badly, we're not going to want to spend time with them. And just because you define something as bad, it doesn't mean that the other person in your family defines it as bad. And just because you define something as good, it doesn't mean the other person in your family defines it as good. In addition, I feel quite strongly that every single person must have their free will honoured. In other words, every single person on this planet has the ability and should be given the freedom to make their own choice. And the only time that that should ever be um, restricted is when the person's choice is unloving and can be demonstrated to be unloving. Now many people when they start embracing any area of personal development, and in particular when they start embracing personal development in love, often change. And this, this often causes members of their family or their friends to become concerned. But change is inevitable if somebody is going to grow. And, and I believe we need to look quite strongly at why a person feels that they have to leave us in order to change. This is an indication that we are placing restrictions on them, not allowing them to change. So if I was a person who was concerned, what I would be doing is firstly looking at myself and going, is my treatment of my family member, friend who has left me, is, has my treatment been loving? Or have I been pushy and demanding and yelling and screaming and telling them they had to do what I'm suggesting and browbeating them all the time and manipulating them all the time and trying to get some cult expert in to, to, to fix them or whatever it is that I have been doing that's out of harmony with the free will of the individual? Because if you do those particular things, undoubtedly the other person is going to leave your life because they're not going to enjoy that attack. My suggestion is if you desire to attack a person in such a way, look at your own unloving emotions and your own fears, because obviously your fears are causing you to act in an unloving manner and you need to adjust your actions. If families are concerned for their loved ones being involved with you, what would you say to them? My suggestion to those families would be to come along to a seminar or two at least and examine what actually does happen at the seminars. You don't have to come along to listen to the information. Come along and just examine what happens at the seminars. Come along and look at, the, you know, spend some time with your friend or your family member and spend some time not in concern for them, not trying to push them into doing something you want them to do, but spend some time in their life and just see how they live their life. You will see that the majority of the people you are concerned of have no day-to-day -day interaction with me at all. The reason why this is the case is that Mary and I spend most of our time sharing information, 
in public, either in interview situation or in a seminar situation or in groups. And we spend very little of our time with individuals because we have very little time left over from spending our time in public to share time with individuals. You do not need to be concerned for your family or your friends because you can easily just come along and see what they're doing at any point in time. And you would see that what they're doing is very, very innocent in the sense that it's all about developing in love, truth and humility. Now, if your family member is emotional, well, what do you expect? They're growing. They're going to be emotional through the process of growth. They are, I'm encouraging people to become like a child with the expression of their emotion. In other words, to honour their emotion at every point in time in their experience. If you're confronted by that, then my suggestion is to look at why you're confronted by that. Because there's no need to control a person with their emotion. Why do you want to control their emotion? Why do you believe their emotion should be controlled? These are all things I believe a family member needs to look at. So my suggestion is come along to a few seminars You'll see how innocent everything is run, how, how very open and straightforward they are. If you examine the 700 hours of YouTube seminars, you'll see that every one of them is run pretty much the same way. There's no editing. Everything you see is exactly what you get. There is no subterfuge. There is no deceit. There is nothing to be concerned about. But the best way for you to find that out is by not listening to media reports and not listening to internet forums of people who have never spoken to me or have spoken to me for, to a, for a few hours five years ago, but rather it's people who interact with me on a day to day basis. And you can be one of those people who interact with me on a day to day basis and find out whether there is any problems with me. And, and I'm pretty sure, as I am pretty sure with most people who meet me, they feel like there is no problem. <laughs> it's only people who listen to media reports that are false, that are lie-based reports, that are going to feel there's any kind of a problem. Do you try to stop other people from being influenced by their friends, family, or the public generally? No, the reality is I believe that every single person on this planet is influenced by somebody. Most of us are influenced by the media. Many times we are lied to and we're influenced by the lies. In a family situation, many times we are influenced by other members of the family. They make a suggestion and, and often we follow it even when we wouldn't have followed it if they didn't make the suggestion. That is influence. The reality is we are unable to avoid influence from any single person on this planet. In terms of my own influence over others, all I do is I share what I believe to be the truth with any person who asks me what I believe the truth to be. That's all I do. That's the only level of influence I have over any other person, which actually is the same level of influence that any other person on this planet has over another person. I do not manipulate, control. I speak openly about the truth. I state it openly and straightforward. I do not bend it or manipulate it to suit myself. And so therefore, there is no other form of influence that a person can receive from me. All I am going to do is state the truth as I believe it to be and leave it open for you to decide. That's all I'm going to do. That's the entire level of influence I have over any individual. If you found out that someone attending your seminars mm -hmm. was examining other literature or belief systems, what would you do? I would celebrate their choice to exercise their free will to gain more knowledge. I believe that this is a very essential part of investigating any truth. We need to be able to be free to investigate knowledge that comes from any source and test it through our own experience. We need to be free to do that. Any religion or any organisation that prevents that from occurring, I feel is cult-like in their behaviour. Myself and Mary do not prevent people from examining more truth from any source. In fact, we encourage it. We have encouraged people to go to different religions if they were one. We have even encouraged people who have been skeptical of Christianity to go and visit some of the churches to get to know some of the people. And they will see that the people are not as bad as what they think. So we've encouraged people constantly to examine every issue for more truth. 
We certainly do not excommunicate them for finding out some more truth. We don't try to prevent them from finding out more truth. We don't even prevent them from going on internet forums that are attacking towards myself and Mary. We don't even make the suggestion that they should not go. Many people go for whatever reasons they have. We don't know, and I don't know why they want to do it, but they do, and that's fine too. Maybe they have lots of doubts about us and they like these forums because it sort of helps them through some of their doubts. That does not matter to me. All that matters is that I want to present information that I believe that to be the truth to any person who has a desire to hear it. I don't want to present it to any person that does not have a desire to hear it. I do not want to manipulate any person into listening just to me and no one else. I want people to discover as much truth as they possibly can by listening to as many people as they possibly can and then working through their own experience of that particular information. Many cults filter information to their members. How do you filter information given to your group? I do not filter any information given to the group. I share with every single person any information that they're willing to ask a question about. I do not have any level of control over any single person in any of the group. In fact, I do not even have a group. They are just people who come along to seminars that we organise. Some of the people are the same people who came along to the last seminar because they liked what they heard the last time they came along. But we don't have a group of people. There are many people who come in, listen for a while, go away. There are many people who have only heard me once in a seminar. There are many people who have only heard me present information on the internet through YouTube. There are many people who have only heard information audio in audio form. That's because I don't control how anybody does anything. What I wanted to do, all I want to do is present what I believe to be the truth to people and give them the opportunity to hear it. That's all we are doing. We do nothing else. We do not filter information. We do not pre prevent people from discovering information for themselves. We do, not, we do not tell them they should not discover other information and we do not prevent them from reading other books and other material. In fact, we encourage them to do so. We want people to have as much information as their finger, at their fingertips as they possibly can have in order for them to make the most wise decisions for their own life that they can. Some people around you feel they have to be careful about what they say and do. Why do you feel that is if you are not a cult leader? <laughs> Why do people have to be careful about what, uh, what they say and do around me? Well, I don't know why people feel like they have to be careful about what they say and do around me because I'm not careful about what I say and do around them. And I encourage everybody to just be open and truthful with me about what they're saying and doing. However, I do understand at times that people become afraid of hearing the truth under certain circumstances. I am a person who is willing to state exactly what I feel at all times with every single individual that I interact with. Now, most people who interact with me after a certain period of time, they go through this period where they start feeling like, what's he going to say next? What's the next thing that's going to be challenged? What's the next truth that he's going to tell me that he believes, you know? And so what they do then is they start being a bit afraid. Like they start going, well, do I want to go up and speak to him or don't I? Like if I go to speak to him, what will he tell me about myself that I don't want to hear? What, what you know, what, I might get angry with him and how is he going to act then? And, what, you know, and they start questioning their own behaviour with me. And as a result, they become afraid in their interaction with me. But that's their own emotional stuff. I don't see it as my issue. All I see it is I am willing to state the truth and be honest and open in every single interaction with every single person at every single time I can possibly be. I attempt to do that with as much kindness as I can muster because I feel a feeling of love towards the people who I am stating the truth to. If a person comes up and asks me a question, I will state what I believe to be the answer at the time. If I believe they don't want to know the answer, I'll say, I don't believe you want to know the answer. Many people find that confronting and so some people become afraid of me as a result. I don't feel there is any need to be afraid of me. As Mary and other people who know me more intimately know, I'm just really a, a, a ver like a cuddly teddy bear <laughs> who uh, has a lot of love for people. But 
who is just different in this one aspect and that is that I'm willing to state the truth in every interaction. So I believe that for the majority of people, the main reason why they are afraid of me, if they are afraid of me, and I suggest to you that the majority aren't, but any person who is afraid of me is, is, is primarily afraid of me because they're just afraid of what they might hear from me. And, uh, and if that's the case, my suggestion is don't have an interaction with me then. I'm perfectly okay to not say anything um, and just feel my love for the person rather than saying anything. I don't feel the need that I have to share any information with a person unless they ask. So my, my feelings are address the emotional issue of fear and then we can have a decent, straightforward interaction. People in cults are generally asked to hide their true thoughts and feelings. Do you ask this of your members? Definitely not. I ask that any person who I interact with, and by the way, there is no members, so I must clarify that first. There is no membership of anything. We don't have any members, we don't have any followers, we don't have any group, we don't have any organised thing whatsoever. All Mary and I do is organise seminars, workshops, different, different events that we share information with people. That's all we do. Now, at, at these particular events, we share lots and lots of different information and a lot of this information is sometimes information that we love to share with people and sometimes it's information that people have questioned us upon. That is the primary source of the information. What we do encourage at each event is that people are openly honest and truthful with us about everything they think and feel. That's what we strongly encourage. We actually strongly encourage everybody to do that with each other as well as us. We feel that this is the only way to become real, the only way to become actually connected with yourself is to honour your own viewpoints, opinions and honour your own feelings. And to do this you must state what you feel in every situation and state what you think. I am perfectly content to have a person state to me, I think you're an idiot, AJ. I'm okay with that. I'll go, okay, that's your opinion and you're entitled to your opinion. I'm not okay with them condescendingly treating me because they think I'm an idiot. Because that is an act of love or a lack of love. And I'm, I, I'm, I feel that I'm worth just as much as they are in order to be treated lovingly. But I'm perfectly happy for people to state their opinion. And in fact, I desire people to state their opinions more and more. I want people to be open with their opinion because if they were more open with their opinions, they'd understand more about what they believe, they'd understand more about why they feel what they think, why they feel what they feel emotionally, and why they feel their feelings support their thinking, their belief systems. They would understand their logical and illogical reasoning systems if they stated what they thought more, and if they stated what they felt more. So we strongly encourage people to state what they feel and what they think. And there is evidence of that all the way through the presentations that we have recorded. Many cults believe their leaders are divinely inspired. Do you feel you're given supernatural revelations, visions and so on? I do not believe I have been given supernatural visions, revelations and so on. I believe, however, that I can be divinely inspired. The reason why I feel that is because if I am connected to God and in a relationship with God, then God can share information with me. I do not believe that I am the only person on the planet who is capable of entering this condition because I believe every single child of God is capable of a relationship with God where God shares the truth with them. So I believe that every person on the planet is capable of being divinely inspired. Supernatural visions and other types of things are all generally given by spirits. And I do not have these kind of connections with spirits. And so I do not have visions and other things like that. I have memories about my life that I am sharing with people. Memories about what I've discovered about divine truth. Memories of what I've discovered about God's love memories of what I have discovered about how to actually connect with God. And these are the things that I'm sharing with people. 
I do not believe that I am the only person who is capable of being divinely inspired. I feel every single person who desires a loving connection with God will eventually become divinely inspired. Many cults punish people who do not conform. Do you punish people who do not follow you or your teachings? I definitely do not punish people who do not follow my teachings or follow me. I don't want anybody really to follow me. I would love people to follow my teachings if they want to, but I don't punish them if they don't. There are many people who come along to my seminars and who have been coming for four or five years who I know every single day of their lives they don't follow what I teach, and yet they still come to my seminars and I still interact with them as individuals. There are many people who have never even come to one of my seminars that I have spent a lot of time with. And there are many workmen that visit our property. There are many other people that we interact with on a day to day basis. And I do not have that kind of relationship with them. I do not desire to punish anyone for anything they do, even if they harm me. However, I do desire to withdraw from people who treat me badly. So if a person is regularly angry with me or a person is regularly attacking of me, then I would decide to not spend much time in their company because I have a feeling of more love for myself than they feel for me at the time. Now, if a person is willing to treat me in a, negatively, in a negative and unloving manner, then, then I feel that they do not love me enough for me to continue an interaction with them. However, if they continue to ask me questions about different manners in a respectful manner, I will continue to answer their questions in a public forum. However, in my private life, I am only going to associate with people who have some level of respect and love for me, just as I would only expect other people to have me in their life if I had some respect and love for them. Do you give personal advice to people? Yes, I occasionally do give personal advice to people. When I say occasionally, the main reason why it's only occasionally is because we do not have the time, Mary and I do not have the time to give advice to people individually all the time. We, we have a lot more public interactions or interactions with larger groups of people than we do private interactions. In addition, because we have public interactions, we prefer to give advice only to people who are willing to also have that advice recorded so that we can share it with others. And many people refuse to do that, of course, and so we cannot give them advice. There are people who decide that they love to share the information that we're sharing with them with others. And under those circumstances, we are willing to provide them with advice as long as that advice can be also placed on the internet in a public forum so that any other person asking a similar question can listen to the conversation. We are willing to give advice, but I am certainly not desirous of the person following my advice. In other words, I have no demands upon the person following my advice. They're able to follow it or not, depending on what they believe. If they wish to have a personal interaction with me, then at some point they're going to have to follow the advice because the advice will always be based around something that's loving or a lack of love not being present. And of course, if the lack of love is not being present in, in the way they treat myself, then if they don't follow my advice, I can't spend more time with them. It's as simple as that. However, if the advice is about something where, you know, they are treating, how they're treating someone else or what they're doing in their personal life, then I have no business to control their life and I will continue providing advice as much as they want it. I am not going to provide advice about what a person can do medically and I'm not going to provide advice about uh, what a person should do with their, with their partner, for example, unless their partner was present. There are certain stipulations that I have on providing advice because I believe many people take advice out of context. When Mary and I provide advice, we normally record every single piece of advice we give. The reason why we do that is if the person misrepresents our advice, we can go back to the recording and show them how they are misrepresenting the advice that we have given. We actually suggest that each person who takes our advice or who wants it 
also records for themselves a you know the advice itself the reason why we suggest that is because we have found in the past that many people believed we said things that we haven't actually said in our conversations with them and when they've re-listened to the recordings they realized that their belief was based around their own emotional response to what we said rather than what we actually said so my suggestion is anybody who wants personal advice understands that it's very hard for us to give personal advice unless it's going to benefit lots and lots of people the reason why is because if we gave personal advice to every person we knew we would have no life ourselves we'd have no time to do the things we enjoy and we'd have no time to share truth publicly so our focus is sharing truth publicly and if you're willing to have your piece of advice shared publicly then we are willing to provide advice under those circumstances given our time and our circumstances depending on our desires do you tell people what to believe definitely not i what i tell people is what i believe and then i get them to question what they believe through what i believe now they don't have to know they don't have to do what i believe or practice what i believe or or tell others what i believe or any of those things if a person comes to ask me a question about what i believe i will tell them the truth about what i believe i do not expect them to accept the belief that is up to them and that is up to their personal experience and in fact in my experience the majority of people do not accept what i believe until they go through their own personal experiences and then they come to believe similar things to what I believe as a result. And I, I actually feel that every person who connects to God directly and actually connects to God through this personal experience will eventually come to believe very similar things to what I currently believe. But I don't feel that there is any need for them to do so. I don't feel that they must do so in order to have an interaction with me. And I don't feel that I can force them into believing anything. And in fact, if I tried to force them into believing anything, I would be out of harmony with my own teachings because my own teachings demonstrate free will at all times, a respect for free will at all times. And so if I do not respect another person's free will, I am automatically out of harmony with my own teachings. And that would, be an, uh, that would make me a hypocrite. So my suggestion to people is that if they come and ask me a question, expect me to say exactly what I think but also do not expect that I'm trying to get them to believe exactly what I think just because I state what I think with a definite assurance and just because I state it categorically it doesn't mean that I believe that the other person must accept what I'm saying but I will say things with conviction when I am firmly convinced and I obviously will come up with many logical arguments as a result of those convictions if my arguments are illogical, then tell me that they are illogical and we can have a discussion. That's what I believe every person needs to do in any interaction with any person, let alone any interaction with myself.